It is now time to hear from two experts in policy and AI. Richard Wingfield, Director of Technology Sectors at BSR, and Elizabeth Krosik, Head of EU Government Affairs and Global AI Policy Lead at Relex. Richard and Elizabeth, I'm going to embarrass you just a little bit by talking about your brilliant backgrounds while you're looking at me. Uh, Richard works with tech companies to build human rights considerations and practices into their products, their services, their policies, much needed, right? And he brings a really robust understanding of international human rights law and standards and how to translate corporate responsibility to respect human rights into actual practice. Elizabeth is a UK trained barrister working across Brussels and London with expertise in advocacy, lobbying, comms, media, and corporate responsibility. She leads the EU team of government affairs experts at Relix Group and is co-president of the British Chamber of Commerce for EU and Belgium. And she also, when she's not completely occupied with very, very full-time work, serves on the boards of the European Internet Forum and the Public Affairs Council EU. Richard, Elizabeth, I'm going to hand over to you. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Gosh. <laughs> um, thank you for that, Shivi. That was very uh, that was very flattering at least. <laughs> At least, um, Richard, I'm going to I'm going to kick off, if I may, um, because I'm fascinated by the work that you do. Um, and obviously, we've been hearing through the day the, the relationship between AI and the SDGs. But from your perspective and the perspective of your organization and your background in human rights, what do you think that AI can do in this space to enhance development? Thanks, Elizabeth. Really great to, to, to be here with you. Um, and that's such a Good question. I think when we think about technology or we see technology in the media, it can often seem very sort of worrying. We see some of the kind of the, the risks or the harms connected with technology. And I think it's really important to remind ourselves of just how fantastic technology can be to advance human rights and, and development. And we've heard loads of examples over the course of today. When it comes to AI specifically, there's been some really interesting developments in the use of AI in healthcare, for example, the use of AI to help improve the quality of diagnosis, of, of treatment of diseases, and even developing medication and cures um, for some of the, the, the illnesses and diseases that, that we still see across the, the world as well. Another big area where I think we're going to see a huge role of AI playing is just in driving efficiency. So we know that the requirement um, of governments to fulfill human rights or to, to, to make progress with development requires on the delivery of, of public services, whether that's energy, uh, other types of infrastructure, whether that's education, healthcare, which I've just mentioned and so forth. AI has huge potential to be able to drive efficiencies in these processes, to, you know, reducing costs and therefore allowing public services to be, to be um, better delivered. There are also lots of kind of smaller ways maybe that, that AI is going to play a huge role um, in the future as well, which will help with development. So one of the barriers, for example, that we often see when you're looking at things like capacity building um, or working with, with, with vulnerable or marginalized communities can be language barriers, um, particularly working with communities who maybe speak a, a sort of a minority language or one that's not well known, meaning that they're limited in their ability to access information that, that can be hugely helpful. AI has huge potential to, to sort of incredibly quickly eliminate the need for expensive translation software or for interpreters, and basically to be able to bring sort of the world's information in whatever language to, to, to everybody. So there's loads of different ways from sort of quite big things like curing diseases to quite small things like helping with translation, where AI can play a really exciting role. And we're beginning to see some of that already, but, but you know, as has been a theme a bit to, throughout the day, we're only really at the beginning of seeing what AI can do. So there's an awful lot more, more to come. Um, and you say, you say, Sorry, can yeah. I just ask you, you say <laughs> yeah, efficiencies and I hear unemployment. So yeah. how do we balance that? Um, because obviously that's really important, particularly in the public sector. We're seeing it, public sector squeezed everywhere. But how do we manage those two things? That's a question that I think we're still grappling with as a, as a society. And, and what we what, what I don't think we're entirely clear yet, what I don't think is entirely clear yet, is where those job losses or those task losses are going to fall. So I suspect it will be the case that there will be very few jobs that in their entirety become completely redundant. But there will be certain tasks that we all do that, that will no longer be necessary or will be done much more efficiently. And if your job, if you know, if a large part of your role includes those kinds of tasks, 
then yes, maybe AI will have an impact. So you can look at things like, as I just mentioned, translation. It may be that AI replaces the need for interpreters. We're starting to see the impacts of generative AI in the creative sector and what that means for you know photographers, visual designers, um, writers, artists, musicians, um, for example. Um, so, it's, so I think part of the solution is reskilling. I don't think that's a silver bullet, but I think we need to look at how we continually reskill populations so that they can adapt to new workplace environments or, 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 or use AI in their existing roles. Um, but I think there are also going to be some, some difficult questions about jobs that maybe society you know, are no longer necessary in the way that we've lost certain jobs in the past. I don't think we're at a point yet where we know how to identify those completely um, or work out what the solution is. But, but I think having that question continually in mind, particularly if you're a company who's, who's developing an AI system that might impact upon people's jobs, I think those are exactly the kind of questions that we need to be thinking um, a lot more about than we have so far. Which maybe kind of allows me to, to, to bounce a question back to you, which is, I'm a bit of a tech enthusiast and I always see the excitement of, and opportunities that come with new technology. Um, but my human rights background, you know, demonstrates that, that there are always going to be risks. And we've seen some of those materialize already in the media. Could you maybe talk us through some of the risks that, that you see in you, your role, um, whether to individuals or to, or to society, and perhaps, you know, explain why, why we're now talking about regulation and ethics a lot more than we used to be? So that's me and you get the nice stuff. Here's all the good things. And then you throw back to me, what are the risks? So I would just want to start with saying, as you said, there are amazing benefits and it's not just technology. It's, it's a gateway, it's an opportunity, it's knowledge and it empowers. But as with any technology, it comes with risks. So, you know, and, and all technologies do knife in the wrong hands, cars can kill, you know, so in that sense, it's not that different. It's the scale. And I suppose the obvious things that come to mind when we're talking about AI are things like bias, discrimination, lack of uh, risks to privacy, actually accessibility, lack of equity, equality, um, and energy footprint. I mean, I could go on. And obviously, we need guardrails, we need governance, and we need rules. Um, but also, and I, I'm encouraged by this, I think we need conversation and, and shared experience to help get this right, because I think we're all seeing there isn't one person or one authority who's got all the answers. And I think what's really reassuring is how much the organizations do want to work together. Um, and actually, although you can see different ways that countries and regions look at AI, they pretty much want similar things. If you're a democratic country, you primarily want your AI to be safe, you want it to be secure, you want it to be trustworthy, uh, you want it to be human centric, you want it to be responsible, uh, you want it to be ethical. I, I think there's a lot of alignment. And you just need to look at the G7 declaration last week uh, in, I think it was in Puglia, Italy, someone's got to go. Um, and they their, their um, declaration was on promoting safe, secure, trustworthy AI. And it's all about shared democratic values, respect for human rights, and actually, that whilst we should all be working on AI governance, that each organization, well, each region or country might have a different approach, but those approaches need to be interoperable. And I think that is what's important to us as Relics and other companies. If we have zillions of different and, interoper and not oper interoperable approaches, then it's very hard to get it right. So... I think we need to have the shared understanding of risk management and we need to advance international standards, develop reporting frameworks and so on. I think these are all positive developments. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I agree entirely. I mean, I think in many ways, in many ways, that's why it's quite helpful to use existing frameworks like international human rights standards or the sustainable development goals as sort of setting out what we want to achieve with AI. So if we want to, you know, avoid discrimination and bias, human rights providers, provides us with a great framework of, of, of standards that we can look to. If we want mm. to encourage the use of, of, of um, artificial intelligence that benefits society, the sustainable development goals give a really clear indication of what, what good looks like when it comes to, when it comes to progress. Um, yeah. Is that a I challenge mean, that it, you're finding at Relics particularly, the, the sort of the, the potential proliferation of different standards that you might need to look to? Um, I mean, I think um, it's really only just, I mean, it's really only just starting. 
um, that standards discussion specifically for AI, though there are lots of standards that apply to AI around privacy and so on. We're plugged into all of those as well. Um, but I mean, it certainly will be, I mean, the EU now with this AI Act, and I'm sure you'll, you'll want to talk a bit about that as well, um, is going to be delivering a lot of that through standards. And it's already set, it's already given its standards body, SENSENLAC, um, the kind of uh, the, 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 the paperwork for it to start going off with these standards. But I think we know that the standards bodies work with broader international standards bodies as well. And I think as business, I think we should really be encouraging that. Um, and I know you've been following the AI Act as well. So do you have the same view about how the standards are going to work? I think it is ultimately, even it's a regulation, but ultimately I think it's standard setting and it's saying, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's actually setting the standards for the democratic world, I would say. Yeah, or there's been an interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in, indeed, um, and there's been some an, an interesting um, trend of different types of organisations setting standards in different ways. There's a huge amount of work going on in terms of very technical standardisation relating to AI in bodies. You know, you'll know from your work on the Internet Forum, but in bodies that have been very used to technical standards, now looking at AI to make sure that the that, that the technology itself is, you know, interoperable and working effectively. And you mentioned the AI Act that the EU has developed, which, of course, is an effort to try and harmonise standards across the 27 EU member states. And what's been really interesting, I think, about the EU's approach is how it's really tried to ingrain those democratic values into its approach. The, a the EU you know, could have looked at AI and said, well, we're going to regulate it in the same way that we regulate you know, toasters and kettles and ovens and we'll just focus on product safety. Um, and those, those, that kind of a very narrow, narrow sort of attempt to make sure the products were, you know, safe in a very limited sense but if you look at the approach that the eu has taken it's actually to prohibit certain types of ai because they feel that the risks posed are, are simply unacceptable in in a democratic society and so they're looking at certain things like um the use of ai to determine through biometrics emotional recognition in certain circumstances um or the use of ai to uh create credit scores about individuals which which then sort of give you entitlement or disentitled to certain certain benefits so the EU has kind of said, well, actually, there's certain types of AI that are just not acceptable in a democratic society, and, and they're going to be prohibited. And then, of course, for the other types of AI that, that pose high risks, things like the use of AI maybe um, for recruitment purposes or in the education system or by law enforcement or immigration authorities, those areas where those risks of, of bias and privacy that you mentioned um, could materialise with really serious impacts for people. There are some really strong safeguards in terms of making sure that your data sets are, are free from bias, that you undertake um, proper testing of the AI systems, that you uh, um, have proper, proper quality control and risk management systems in place to make sure that you kind of work out where the risks might be and you, 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 know, you, you mitigate them before the product is, is used or deployed. So it's actually not just about product safety, but embedding values into the types of AI that we, that we want to see and the kinds that we don't want to see. And I think what will be really interesting is whether other governments around the world follow suit and, and emulate the EU or whether they go off in, in, a, in a slightly different direction, maybe develop AI regulation that's more sectoral um, rather than the sort of the cross cutting approach that the EU that the EU has taken. But what, what, yeah. what are your thoughts? What is Alexis? Yeah, response well, to AI I think Act? I think on the on the general um I think if you look at kind of the map of where regulation is going now, obviously, the AI Act is the first. Brazil, I think, is looking at the AI Act now with a view to pretty much, um, do, you know, looking at a similar style of legislation. Um, I think there are pockets coming up everywhere, and you're right. The approach is some, is different. So the UK is looking much more sectorally. The US the same. But as you said, the basic fundaments of what it should look like, I think, are all pretty similar. And, and that is what kind of surprised me, I suppose. If you, were, if you were to do a kind of, you know, word cloud, I think you'd see the same set of words over and over again, preventing bias, ensuring transparency, et cetera, et cetera, all the things I said earlier. So I feel in a way it's like different approaches, but to the same end game, um, which, and so for us, I mean, for Relics, in terms of the actual, you know, the implementation of the AI Act. I mean, I guess the first thing I would actually say is um, the that which is high risk is relatively small amount of AI that's out there. So not that many products that we do would be caught within high risk. But 
I'm going to take it the other way around and say that the AI Act has only just passed and is actually not yet on the statute books. But we have been working with AI for at least a decade, and some of our data scientists would say longer. Um, we have had externally facing responsible AI principles for several years now and internal ones much longer. And why is that? And that is because, well, we're a global provider of information based analytics decision tools and we are committed to corporate responsibility and that defines how we work. And actually, if you were to look at the um, our responsible AI principles, they're available um, if you just if you just put it into the search engine, um, we actually took a very broad de definition of AI. We didn't want to get caught up in the kind of legalistic definition, but we just took it as machine-driven insights that come from our tools. And then we provide a risk-based framework which draws on best practice. And so those responsible AI principles are high-level guidance, um, but the detail, the implementation, is owned by the individual companies of RELEX, so whether that's Elsevier or LexisNexis and so on, because they have to implement the principles in a way that's appropriate to their business. It cannot just be top, you know, kind of top down. It's got to be across the businesses as well. And as I mentioned earlier, they also complement other things that we do, other policies, other processes, whether that's data privacy or whatever. And though that forms the basis of what we, we do, but obviously we also do training, we have discussion, and actually the principles themselves are iterative. In fact, we are just going through a round now of reviewing them and seeing, for example, should we have generative AI in there? Is that something that sits? Because when we drafted them, we weren't talking about generative AI. So, you know, how does that sit? So we're having some internal discussions now about those types of things. So it is iterative, it's, it's a snapshot in time. Um, but it is, I, we feel that that's, you know, that's really important. And so that guides, you know, back to your question, does the AI introduce, Act introduce anything new? No, not really, because we already adhere to the ethos of it. We do all that risk assessment, risk management, data governance, bias mitigation, you name it. But of course, any product that we do deliver that would be considered high risk will have a more formal structure um, there will be conformity assessment. You'll have to attach a, a C marking uh, to the system. There'll be generally more reporting reporting requirements, but you know, not more than we would expect for something, frankly, as as in, as important as this. Um, so yeah, <laughs> um, I'm really interested, yeah. if I may, on on your side to know. I mean, you have a me yeah. you're membership driven, right? You've got companies as members, yeah, I believe. So That's right, yeah. How? What's your experience of the way they're looking at it? Do they see the AI Act as something, you know, worrying that they have to be concerned about, or do they see it as kind of cost of doing business? I think, as you say, a lot of them have been doing this kind of work voluntarily for for a while now, um, and so many companies who had committed to corporate responsibility, whether that's the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights or the UN Global Compact or these other frameworks that already existed for the companies to, to behave ethically. I think many of them very quickly realized that AI was going to be a significant part of their potential risk profile or was going to raise um, risks and, and so have put in place governance structures and policies and processes really over the last five or six years in particular. Um, and as, as with Relix, many of the aspects of the AI Act you know, really reflect what companies were already doing in the first place. And I think that relationship between regulation and company sort of activity is going to be so critical because, as you say, when you developed your AI principles, you know, no one was talking about generative AI. And with the AI Act, when that was drafted three years ago, no one was talking about generative AI and they had to quickly add some language on at the very end. So regulation think, is always yeah. going to be playing catch up to the development of yeah. technology. And so, you know, it's an important safeguard but it's you, you can't rely on regulation completely and so i think companies have recognized this for the over the last few years i mean that's not to say there aren't differing levels of sophistication in in where companies go and it's been interesting to observe for example companies that keep all of their ai um expertise in house and they might have a, a sort of a cross-functional um committee or, or governance process that oversees the company's use of ai we've seen others that have brought in um uh, advisory councils or external experts to act as a sounding board to certain business decisions or, or, or use cases where they want an independent voice. We've seen differences between those that kind of centralize their AI function and those that disperse it and bring together a range of different functions together. 
Um, so it's it's been kind of interesting to see different models of governance uh, with regards to AI play out. And of course, it all depends on what kind of company you are, what size you are. If you're a tech company or if you're a company that uses tech, but you don't develop tech yourself, there are different ways of, of bringing this together. But as you said, if you were to do a word cloud of all of the sort of the policies and the principles, it would look pretty consistent in terms of what companies were trying to achieve. So I, I'm hopeful that there is a degree of alignment between companies' existing processes and regulation. But I think we will still need companies to not see regulation as, as a sort of the bare minimum that they should ever do, but always be thinking about new risks and new issues that might go beyond what the law says and making sure that they're, they're well placed to address those in the future um, as well. So, yeah, yeah it, so I'm kind of, cool, right. I guess, in that sense. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. I mean, we, as I said, we, I think we drafted our principles for internal consumption probably five years ago. So, yeah, before anything, yeah, hit the ground. So we just need, we do need to keep ahead. It's not just the tick box. I think that's what's important. If you just want to do a tick box exercise, that's one thing. But if you want to be, to do this properly and ethically as a company, then you have to be committed and you have to take it seriously. I, I've got a cheeky question for you, actually. What do you think of the AI Act? Do you think it's good regulation? You're sitting in the UK. I, think, I can I think ask it's, that it's question, complex right? regulation. <laughs> <laughs> with with the, the benefit of the, the, the channel between 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 me um, and the regulation, I think we have to remember this is the very first effort that a government has made or a group of governments to regulate AI, and it's no mean feat. This is an incredibly complex technology, and a lot of work has gone into it. I don't think it's going to be perfect. I think it, it, there's going to be a degree of iteration and experimentation with regulation to see what's effective or, or, or not. It's quite complex, and I think because of the EU as an institution that developed it, there's been a degree of compromise between different political and other considerations in drafting the language, which means that in places it's a little bit unclear because I think it was the, the result of compromise between different positions, and so there's been sort of compromised language that, um, that that we might to think through and sort of test a little bit as to what it means in practice. But I think it's a, it's a really strong first start, and I think as with things like the EU's GDPR, a lot of other governments will be looking to the EU's AI Act as a starting point for their own regulation as well. So I don't think it's it's perfect. Um, I think it's quite sort of complicated. There's a lot of terminology that we still are going to have to test out in practice as to what it means. Um, but it's also a really strong first start, and I think it'll give us a good a good period now to see what regulation looks like as compared to the voluntary processes that have that have led the way previously. So you know, from yeah. that perspective, I'm really curious to see to see uh, to see what happens over the next few years. And I don't know if you you know, and it's it's still gossip. It's not confirmed, so I could be wrong. But the one of the drafters of the AI Act in the European Parliament is now going to the AI office to implement the act that he was drafting. Yeah, so the uh, the Romanian rapporteur. So uh, <laughs> that's a really yeah, good example is... of <laughs> implementing what you drafted, <laughs> which is this actually is quite a good thing. Quite good, right? Obviously, yeah. yeah no, I it. think. Absolutely. And I, and, I, and I think it's what's, what's been really helpful is, as you say at the start, you know, we're looking at, you know, we're talking largely about democratic countries. And then, of course, there are parts of the world where there are some more concerning uses of AI or different approaches to regulation. But I think the EU really has tried to be a, a world leader in global standard setting when it comes to technology. We saw that with the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, with the GDPR, of course, which has huge implications for technology um, and data. And I think it's making similar efforts now with the AI Act. And so I think if there's going to be a part of the world that is a global leader in standard setting, from a democratic perspective, I think, you know, preferable to see the EU take the lead than, than, than other parts of the world where the use of AI is, is more concerning. Um, but yeah, the, the legislation yeah. Won't, won't come into full effect though for another three years. So I think we'll still be having conversations. We'll keep for a good exactly. Years that, the AI Act. Exactly. I was <laughs> going to say thank you to Marty and her team for introducing us, Richard. This might be the first conversation we've had, but it's definitely not going to be last. Uh, no, the I'll last. See, I'll I've see got you next your year. number now. <laughs> <laughs> Look forward to it. I think thank we're you. on on the hour or on the quarter. We are bang on time, actually. Yeah. Really well done. Very, very high accuracy there. <laughs> that, that was such an interesting one to watch. Honestly, Richard and Elizabeth, I was jotting down all manner of notes as we went on around AI and policy, around the AI Act, but also to be able to hear your experience on the cost of doing business as it reconciles with that 
ethical responsibility, corporate responsibility, some of the pitfalls from generative AI. I speak about this a lot as an innovation futurist. But then also, how do we balance that with the aspects of AI actually furthering and enhancing positive outcomes, commercially and otherwise, whilst being very, very mindful of how it circles back to policy. Thank you very, very much.